Welcome to River City Online. We're so happy that you guys are here. We have a very challenging and very special message for you today. Guys, at the end of service, we will be having communion, so make sure you have those elements ready before that time comes. Again, thank you for being here. Prepare your hearts for worship. More people living real life by passionately following Jesus. That's the reason we do everything around here. Every event, every service, every outreach, every dollar is spent to make that vision a reality. More people living real life by passionately following Jesus. But what is real life? Real life is community. Real life is heart change. Real life is vulnerability. Real life is growing together. Real life is unspeakable joy. Real life is hope. Real life is restoration. Real life is serving others. Real life is following Jesus. 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 Why Jesus? Because Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. The life he lived and the life he gave is the DNA for real life. Jesus' life is our example for real life. And while we recognize that our everyday lives look pretty different right now, we know that we can have hope, peace, and joy through Jesus. Because real life through Jesus hasn't changed a bit. So we're inviting everyone, 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 everyone to see more people living real life by passionately following Jesus. And we're inviting you on that journey to real life right, right now. now. Well, hey, everyone. It is great to have you with us. Uh, we're just going to begin worship in just a moment, but I want to share a song with you. We want to share a song with you. I was listening to this song this week, and it's one of those things that made me want to dance. And I know you're there in your living room, and you may not dance. I hope maybe you will. But by the end of the song, I know you'll be tapping your foot and you'll thank me on Tuesday because this song gets into you like an earworm, okay? We have a lot to be thankful for and this is a song all about Thanksgiving and it's just talking about singing to the Lord. So you'll get it real quickly. Sing along. Let's celebrate. All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm going to sing wherever I go. All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm going to sing wherever I go. God is for me. He's not against me. Will hold to the plans he has for me. When I'm broken, he will fix 
are so thankful. We are so thankful that you have been good. You have given us so many reasons to sing, to worship. I just ask that, Lord, in this time together, as we gather in our homes or wherever we're watching this from, I pray that you would be exalted. We love you. We worship you. You are so good. Let's just worship him. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I'll raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I'll raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I'll raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. In the middle of the storm. In the middle of the storm, louder and 
the truth of that phrase, your promises are yes and amen. Lord Jesus, I just pray right now that we would understand the power of prayer. Lord, that we would understand you are the giver of life. You are our creator, you are our maker, and you are good. Just because, Lord, we've all been locked down in the midst of a pandemic, Lord, you haven't somehow slipped off the throne of heaven. You haven't forgotten us. You have been working. You are working. You are good. You can do miracles. Seems like our whole world, Lord, is going crazy all at the same time. And that doesn't mean that you somehow are out or that you've kind of left us to our own devices. Lord, you are present. You are real. Remind us of that. Let our worship and let our praise not just be songs. Let it remind us of who you are. You are so good. We worship you. Help us right now to enter into your presence in a unique way. And let that change us. I worship you. You are here moving in me. I worship you. I worship you. Sing it to me. You are here working in this place, wherever that place is. I worship you. Tell me. I worship you. Let's sing that again. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Tell him, you are the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are here, here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, hailing every heart. I worship you.
miracle worker, way maker, miracle worker, way maker, miracle worker, way maker, you're the miracle worker. My God, you're the miracle worker. May make a miracle worker. Way make a miracle worker. Even when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, Lord, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, no, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I You never stop working. Even now, Lord, I feel you working. Even when I can't see it, you're there working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop. You never stop working. Never stop. You never stop working. Oh, God, we need you. We need your presence. We need your Holy Spirit. Lord, our, it seems like our whole world, our cities are exploding right now. Forgive us. Forgive us our sins, Lord. Forgive. Forgive the sin anger, the hate, the racism. Forgive the sin that started this, Lord. Forgive the sin that continues this, Lord. Forgive us. Lord, as people not just protest, but they riot in cities around our nation. Protesting violence and anger with more violence and anger. I just pray that your Holy Spirit would bring, bring peace. I pray that your church would rise up, Lord. Black, white, brown, yellow. Whatever tone our skin is, Lord, I pray that your church would show the world how to love one another, how to stand together. I pray that we would stand with our black brothers and sisters we have to wrestle with this issue and how to respond. I pray that we would stand with them and they would know they're not alone. They're our brothers and sisters. They're my brothers and sisters. I pray that the whole church would grieve, but then would stand in love and be a model of your grace, your presence, your peace poured out. Make us instruments of your peace in the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask that you do a miracle. I pray that you would in a unique way, allow your church to be a vessel and an instrument for peace. In cities, I pray that 
that you would give creative means for your church to just begin to speak love, grace, peace. Lord, I pray that your justice, real justice, would be poured out. We trust you for that. Lord, we love you. We thank you. And we trust you. And because of you, we look forward with hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Isn't God awesome? He is just, I, I can't imagine going through life without knowing there is a creator, there is a designer, and he's with us, he loves us, he fills us with his spirit. Well, we're going to have a really neat experience next week. We are coming back. We're coming back into this room. We have been doing these services kind of to an empty room, and next week it's not going to be that way. So we're pretty fired up. And so uh, we're going to continue to live stream those services. So if you're in a position where you're, can't, you can't return yet, health reasons, whatever reasons you have, if you're not at that place, we're going to continue to do this. But I hope you'll consider it. I hope you'll consider it. You can go to reallife.org, find out uh, schedule changes. I sent an email out to the whole congregation. Um, but you can find out how we're doing that. You can find out our procedures and all the stuff that we're going to do to make sure that it is a healthy and a safe experience for everyone. But I am looking so forward to getting the body back together and serving and worshiping. Well, you probably know I'm not the typical, usual worship leader, right? That's my son, Ryan. Well, I asked him to speak, and he's going to bring a very powerful message for us, and so I thought the least I could do was step in for him. So in just a moment, Ryan's going to come speak and share. Um, why don't you take just a moment and say hi to everybody in your circle, wherever you're watching. If it's just you and your spouse, well, say hi. God bless. Well, thank you and welcome. Uh, once again, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. My name's Ryan. I appreciate our senior pastor, Sean, asking me to speak. Um, I'm excited about today's message. It was one that, it, it just came out of my private study and reading of the scripture, and so I, I find that for me, some of those are often the most challenging because it's what I'm walking through. We're going to be talking about a specific section from the book of Philippians today. The, the book of Philippians is what is known as an epistle. It's a letter from the Apostle Paul to the church in Philippi. Some quick background on the letter. Um, Paul, when he was writing this, was in prison. So that kind of frames the context of everything that he says. We think he was probably in prison somewhere in Rome. Um, the church that he's writing to was a church of new believers, most of which were probably Gentile, so not from a Jewish background. Um, and Paul's writing to them just instructions on how to live. One of my favorite things about this book is some people call it the happiest book in the Bible. It is a book that is filled with the command to rejoice, and, and, it, and it speaks of Paul's joy, and he um, has wishes for the believers to experience joy. And so it's, it's one that um, in a time where our whole world seems to be very desperately in need of joy, I think it's very timely for us. And remember, Paul's in prison, and so the message of joy coming through his circumstances is even more powerful. So we'll begin in Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. It says this, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. There it is, right off the bat. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me, and it is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks that he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law a Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted for loss, as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that, that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. 
that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Let me pray for us. God, you are so good, and I thank you for your word. I thank you for this message, Father. I pray that you would speak to us today. I pray that you would lead us, Lord. And more and more, Jesus, I pray that our lives would reflect the truth of your gospel. Amen. Amen. So verse 1, um, right off the bat, Paul recaps the idea of the whole letter, letter, which is, once again, rejoice. And then he goes straight into a pretty severe and stern warning. And he says this. He says, look out for the dogs, the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Okay, when an apostle says to look out for dogs and evildoers, that should normally be a, a, a kind of red flag for you that these are really bad people, or at least they're, they're up to no good. And, and so Paul, when he says, look out for the dogs, the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh, he's talking about a group of people that came to be known in the early church as the Judaizers. The whole point of this group was to go and subversively integrate themselves into bodies of new believers and then to slowly convince them that as new believers under the covenant of grace of Jesus Christ, they had to live under the Old Testament law. The problem with this was that, and Paul talks about this extensively throughout his letters, that it is impossible to fulfill the requirement of the law, which is why we needed Jesus, grace, and we're so thankful for that. And so there was this group within the church that was trying to convince people that they had to live under the, under the law, which is the opposite of Paul's message. The attempt was to make converted Gentile Christians or reformed Jewish Christians walk in accordance to the law, not by faith. And to Paul, this idea of living within Old Testament law in an effort to gain righteousness was incompatible completely with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Paul's saying right off the bat, watch out for these people. Don't trust them because we are the ones who are justified. We are the ones who are righteous. And it's not through the law. It's through faith. And I was thinking about as I was reading this passage, this is extremely powerful coming from Paul, this message. And I want to tell you why. In Paul, if you know anything about his past life, you know that in Paul, we don't see a man who rails against a system that he resents for the sake of his failing to thrive in it. The system being the Old Testament covenant, the Hebrew faith. In Paul, we don't see a guy who, because he was um, flunked out of rabbinical school, he rails against the system that mistreated him or rejected him. In Paul, we see a man who was on top of the proverbial food chain that he's now seeking to seemingly dismantle. You see... when a person who hasn't benefited from or been successful within a system speaks against it or rejects it, um, there's one level of consideration. But when one who's thrived in that system, when one who has excelled in it, dominated it, even controlled it, rejects it and rises up against it, there's an entirely different weight that can be perceived. There's a documentary that's um, on ESPN right now, and it's called The Last Dance. It's about the 98 Bulls playoff run, and specifically it's about, it's it's a character study on Michael Jordan. And while I cannot speak to the uh, appropriate nature of the documentary, there's a lot of bad language, there's some stuff that I definitely don't appreciate or condone, it is a powerful glimpse into the mindset of a person who on a worldly level has achieved more than many people could ever dream of achieving. And when I think about Michael Jordan, I see someone who, unlike Paul in his world, achieved to the utmost in their world. Michael Jordan was the epitome. He was the apex of success as a cultural figure and as an athlete. And so when I think about Michael Jordan in the context of this discussion with Paul, I think about how powerful would it be if a person like Michael Jordan, after he achieved so much, he, he, let's say he wins his first three championships, he won six if you didn't know, so it was a lot. Let's say after he wins his first three, he quits not to go to baseball, and he never comes back, and his message is this, all the success I had, all of the wealth I acquired, all of the fame I had, it was nothing. It was a lie. It was meaningless. 
how much more powerful would that message be, the rejection of fame and wealth and celebrity for the sake of something greater, how much more powerful would that be coming from a person like Michael Jordan than from, say, someone like me? I do not have millions of dollars. The whole world does not know my name. I have never won an NBA championship. I did, uh, in you know, third grade football, I did get a participation trophy, and I, you know, I did my best. But I'm nowhere near, not even close, I'm not in the same universe as Michael Jordan when it comes to the level of success and fame he attained within his industry. And within the Hebrew context of tradition and religious establishment, when we talk about the Apostle Paul, I want you to begin to view him not as someone that we don't really understand or know. I want you to view him, he was a Michael Jordan-esque figure in his world, in his context. And that's where he says this. He says, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, that was when you were supposed to be. Of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. So Paul had intelligence, he was intense, he had lineage. At this point in Israel's history, not everyone could trace their lineage back to their, um, the original patriarch that founded their tribe. Paul could. He had all the necessary tools and talents. His zeal was unrivaled. He was gaining a following. He was winning victory over his enemies. He was most likely reaping the benefits relationally, even financially. Paul had everything. And so when he says, whatever gain I had, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. You need to hear someone not speaking who didn't have much to lose. You need to hear someone who had everything that he ever wanted within the context of his world. When Paul says, whatever gain I had, I count it as lost for, the, as lost for the sake of Christ, we need to listen. You see, the Judaizers were seeking to lead the church in Philippi back into an age where you were either justified or condemned based on your works. And Paul, the man who had lived a lifestyle according to the law better than any of them, says to them, it's rubbish. Everything that, not just you, that we built our lives on now because of Jesus to live that same way, it's rubbish. I had made it to the top of my ideology, says Paul, that system, and I gave it all up because I found something real, Jesus Christ. Because of that, Paul gave up everything, his job, his self-importance, his relationship, his worldview, his freedom, probably his home, his life. There are people who think of Paul. This is not confirmed, but there are theories of Paul that he was betrothed before he gave his heart to Jesus, before he encountered Christ. And that as a result of his radical conversion, he actually ended up single for his whole life. So we could say that Paul, more than any of us, gave up everything. And the question is why? Why? Because when Paul met Jesus, hear this, everything in the life that he had known became rubbish. From the day that Paul encountered Jesus Christ, everything else was rubbish. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Jesus Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, he says, by any means possible that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. That's why Paul gave up everything, to gain Christ, to be found in him to obtain righteousness through faith, to know Jesus and to know his power and to share in his sufferings in order to obtain the resurrection from the dead. To have that and that alone, Paul gave up everything and he had a lot to get up. 
to give up. And, and I think that's why Paul's such an important example to us, 21st century believers in the Western world. That's why we need Paul's example. Because to follow Christ, listen to me, we in our world today have much to lose. We have so much to lose because we have so much. That's one of the issues of prosperity. It makes submission so much more difficult. The less you have, this is just, this is just logically true. The less you have, the less you have to lose. For a poor, homeless, bankrupt person to follow Jesus in material consideration only, not spiritual, but just in material, for a poor and homeless person to give up everything and follow Jesus, there is less to lose than for a rich person. I hope you understand that. For many of us in this room, for many of us in our homes watching this, wherever we are, there's a lot to lose. That's why Paul is such a good example. Because listen to me, Paul had a good life. He was well supplied, well thought of, and he gave it all up. Yet even still, even in the similarities, there's one primary difference between us and Paul in regard to this discussion that we have to acknowledge because it makes a huge difference in how we respond. For Paul, to choose Christ was literally to give up everything and he didn't even have to really choose it. It was in many ways chosen for him by others and he knew that the day he decided to follow Jesus. For Paul, the day that he decided to, know Christ, to follow after Christ, he knew the circles that I am in the relationships that I've cultivated, the career that I've chosen, it is all over. It's done. If I have income that's provided as a result of my former life, it's gone. If I have a home that's a result of my former life, it's gone. For Paul, the day that he decided to follow Jesus, it came with the implicit understanding that I'm going to lose most everything that I've built for the sake of Christ. And for many of us, for, all, for most of our lives, that has not been the case. It has not been implicit that not only we may lose some things, but we're going to lose most of everything. And therein lies, for many of us, the greatest danger that we will perhaps face in our life. For Paul and Christians throughout the world for the last 2,000 years, many of them, a decision to follow Jesus was from the first day a decision to see your life, at least as you knew it, end. Christians for thousands of years, living in nations where their, their faith was outlawed, living in nations where to become a Christian meant to be outlawed. They knew the day that they decided to follow Jesus that they were going to give up everything. Children who know that if I become a Christian, my parents are going to kick me out of the home. They know the day, what the cost is. And so for many of them, they're, they're, they have to count the cost early on in a way that we may not have to. And for Paul, that was the case. Starting the day that Paul met Jesus Christ, everything else was rubbish because he was forced to choose between Jesus and everything else. We haven't necessarily had to make that choice in our lives, or so we think. For so many of us, we can choose Christ and, and seemingly from the outside have not very much change. We get to keep our jobs we get to keep our relationships, our homes, our income, our resources. No one externally makes a demand of us to change anything the day we begin to follow Jesus. And while we may consider this a gift, and listen to me, in so many ways, it is a gift. While religious freedom and material prosperity and the right to free speech and free thinking, all of these, all of these things, while they may in some ways be a gift, they are a heavy burden to bear. And here's why. Over and over again, the Bible talks and issues a warning to those who are rich. It says it is hard for the rich to enter into heaven. Why? Because I think the Bible, I think Jesus understood human nature. And he understood that the more that you have in this life, the harder it is to give it up. The rich young ruler is a perfect example of this. Here was a young man who came to Jesus and he, and he was earnest and devout and he worked to follow the commandments of God. And he said, teacher, what must I do to have life? 
And Jesus said, you have to follow those commandments. And he said, I've done all these things and more. And Jesus said, then one thing you lack, just go sell everything that you have, give it to the poor and come follow me. And the scripture says that the young man walked away sad because he was very rich. The implication is that the young man walked away and and decided to walk away from the life that he knew that he wanted in Christ Jesus because he could not part with the things that he had in this life. That's why the gospel says it's so hard to have so much material things, so much prosperity and enter into the kingdom of heaven because if we have much to lose, if we have much, we have much to lose and few will choose to lose it because we can't see fully past what's really going to last and what isn't. And listen, if you're, if you're hearing this today, and you think, I'm, if you think you're off the hook because you're like, I'm not a millionaire, okay? I, I don't have a ton of money in the bank account. Like, I, I'm, I couldn't be rich. I want to define for you what I mean by wealthy. What I mean by wealthy is, is this. And, and truly, this may not be some of us, but I think most of us it, it probably is. I've never in my life seriously worried about where my next meal is going to come from. I've never in my life thought about being homeless on the street. I've never in my life thought about not having clothes. I've never in my life thought about not having transportation. For me, when I'm making negotiations with myself, it's like, man, can I really afford cable or just Wi-Fi? And I think for so many of us, when I talk about wealthy, what I'm talking about is that we have so much and we have access to so much it can sometimes become very difficult to give it up for the sake of Christ. We have so much that we have to choose to give up because, hear me, at this point in our history, we are so blessed to live in a place and a time where we'll never be forced to really lay down anything. At this point, we have freedoms to choose how we spend our money. We have freedom to choose how we spend our time. And that is a gift But it's also the crux of our issue because Paul understood. He knew that compared to Jesus, hear this, if everything else that he had built his life on was not rubbish, his faith was. Let me say that again. Paul knew that compared to Jesus, if everything else that he had built his life on was not rubbish, then his faith would be. And what I mean by that is if you discover the very source of life, which is what Paul believed and knew he had found, if you discover the key to salvation from a certain and painful death, if you find the hope of eternal joy, if you find that in in a being, in a God, everything else must comparably pale when you view it in light of that. Because nothing else is that. Jesus said it like this. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. And a man found that treasure and he went, first he buried it, and then he went and sold everything that he had with joy to buy the field. That's what I'm talking about. I'm I'm saying if, if we encounter the reality of who God promises to be in Scripture and our response is anything less than, wow, he is just so beyond value compared to everything else that I've ever known, I'm willing to give it all up just that I might have him. If that's not our response, then we're missing something. Listen to this challenging statement, and this one, is it, I, I wrestle with it so often. The kingdom of God is so valuable, so perfect, so beautiful, that to lose everything on earth for the sake of the kingdom is a joyful exchange. Man who found the treasure in a field. Jesus said this, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds His life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The part of that that's the most challenging for me is when it talks about our children. I have a three-year-old daughter, and she's amazing. My wife is going to, on Monday, give birth to our son, Moses. 
And when I think about what Jesus is saying, in another gospel, Jesus says, if anyone doesn't hate their father, mother, sister, brother, son, daughter, if anyone doesn't hate them, he's not worthy of being my disciple. And understand, Jesus isn't saying, I want you to hate people. Obviously, that contradicts the law of God. What he's saying is, if compared to me, your very next most important relationship, which for me is my spouse and my kids, if compared to the way you feel about me, it doesn't look like hatred, then you're not worthy of being my disciple. And what that means is that he's saying, you have to love me. You ought to love me so much that everything else pales in comparison. Even the best things in my life, the greatest gifts from God, which is for me, my family, they can't be on the same page as Jesus if I truly know him and seek after him. That is why a life of material abundance is something to give thanks for, but to also be very cautious about, to really look at with earnest intention to follow after Jesus, because Paul confirms to us, and Paul knew that compared to Jesus, if everything else that he had built his life on was not rubbish, then his faith was. I sometimes feel when I pray, like, I, I, I feel kind of crazy because sometimes I ask God to do whatever it takes. And sometimes I almost feel like I'm even praying for persecution or suffering or, or pain or whatever it takes to move my love of things to my love of him, because I know that these things are rubbish. But I live my life, and I look at my heart, and I see all the things that I'm blessed with and all the relationships that I have, and I know that it's so easy for for these things to replace God in my heart. And I'm so desperate to be free from that. I want to be like Paul, where all things are rubbish compared to Christ. Sometimes it's not even having, but it's the pursuit or possibility of having having i've thought that so much when it when it comes to our culture we grow up being told like i can do whatever i want whatever i set my mind to i can do it one of the most famous american ideals is the idea of rags to riches from nothing to everything and i think even just that possibility for so many of us it can cloud our entire motivation in life to where my entire pursuit becomes about having things And not gaining Christ. But if Jesus is everything, the Bible claims he is, and we claim to believe, then hear this, as we meet with him, as we truly get to know who he is, everything else must become rubbish. Or our faith is rubbish. And don't miss this. I believe that because we have so much, um, this issue is perhaps for us, more difficult than it has been in ages past. For so many people in history, to discover Christ was to immediately be elevated in the way that I get to live my life. They had to make a choice, but but yes, but there was instantly um, things that they didn't have. I think so often our prosperity can cloud the beauty of knowing Christ. We have much to lose. Three things, I think. And this includes basically everything that we have. We have our pride, our self-sufficiency to lose. When you come to know Jesus, you no longer rely on your own merits, your own work, your own strength. You acknowledge that he is the one who provides everything. He is the one who justifies us. We have that to lose, our pride. We have our plans. When we follow Jesus, we lose our right to do what we want when we want. My future no longer is about what I dream of or what I desire. It's about, God, what do you see for my life we have our pleasures and this is one that i i I personally struggle with deeply we live in a world that that basically accepts the idea that if i work hard if i make the right choices then i can enjoy the fruits of my labor with any time that i have left and i'm here to tell you today that as a follower of jesus our primary pursuit of pleasure is not in the things that we have but in the one that we know And when I follow Jesus, that shifts the way I live my life. We have so much to lose, but but so did Paul. And he left it behind 
for the sake of a gain that so infinitely outweighed any loss that he could ever suffer because, listen, this is the hope and the truth of the gospel. When you meet Jesus, everything else becomes rubbish because, listen to this, compared to Jesus, everything else is rubbish. That's the truth and the hope of this whole message. Yes, when you, when you follow Jesus, you are forsaking many things. But, but it's never the situation where you sacrifice and you give and you don't expect return. Because listen to me, the gain of Christ, the worth of knowing him so far outweighs anything that we could ever sacrifice, including our very lives. It's not even an equitable exchange. The gain of Christ far outweighs any sacrifice that I could ever make. Listen to what Paul says. Whatever gain I had, whatever there was, I count it as lost for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. When we read Paul, because I sometimes feel this way, I sometimes feel like, well, I'm just not Paul. I'm not that strong. I'm not that disciplined. But when we read Paul, we're not reading a person who was just better than us, who was more disciplined and and had a greater love for truth, and that love for truth outweighed his carnal desires. When we read Paul, we're reading a man who discovered the greatest good. He discovered the greatest pleasure, the greatest of this life, and it was the treasure of surpassing worth. And so because he found that with joy, he gave up things that wouldn't last for something that would last forever. That's what we discover in Paul. St. Augustine said that he who has the Lord has everything, and he who has everything except for God has nothing. And I believe that. I believe that when we discover Jesus, every desire, every hunger, Everything within me that desires more, that desire came from God. It may have been placed in wrong things. It may have been fueled and cultivated and moved in the wrong direction. But the core of who we are, the core of our inexplicable longings is what C.S. Lewis called it, that came from God. And when we find Jesus, we don't just give up our desires and our desire for pleasure and satisfaction and companionship and love and all the things we try to fill the void with. We don't just give those up. We see them satisfied to the fullest. We're not talking today about some noble sacrifice by which we sacrifice joy and pleasure and satisfaction for the sake of duty and honor. We're talking about giving up things that won't last, that won't fill the desires of my heart for the sake of the only thing that will. And so the question for us, the question for you is are you willing to suffer the loss of everything else for the one thing that you were created to have forever for the sake of gaining Christ? When you look at your life, do you see areas where you have sacrificed for the sake of his glory or his kingdom? Do you see areas where you know you're resistant to lay them down? Would you give up if he asks? everything that you have with joy just to be with him if not then my encouragement to you is this if you are not yet willing to suffer the loss of all things for the sake of gaining christ it's not because you're not strong enough it's because you don't yet understand the worth and the beauty of your savior If you aren't willing to give up everything for the sake of Jesus, you don't need more discipline. You don't need more righteousness that comes from you. You just need to believe more in his worth. You need to discover his beauty more. When I say give up everything, what do I mean by that? The word everything simply means that anything in your life that is not Jesus To follow after him, we have to be willing to give up everything. There's this incredible moment in the gospel where um, a man asks to follow after Jesus, or Jesus tells a man to come follow after him, and the man says, first let me go and bury my father. 
And Jesus, in this seemingly very harsh statement, says, let the dead bury themselves. You come follow me. And I think so often what we perceive from Jesus in Scripture is he's trying to help people remove things that have been enthroned on their hearts so that they can experience him to the fullness. So when we say everything, we mean everything. And what do we mean by give up? I mean untangle everything in your life from the throne of your heart except for Jesus. I mean if there's anything that controls your decisions, if there's anything that consumes your thoughts at the sake of your thinking about the Lord or his will, you have to work to get that out. People, your family, friends, coworkers, they need to see God come first in your life. I often tell my wife, and I really believe this, I often tell her, Honey, you don't want me to put you first. Because if I did, I wouldn't be able to love you the way that you deserve to be loved. Listen to me. If you want your relationships to be filled, if you want them to be what they are supposed to be, God has to be the first. He has to be the one who inspires the way you love other people. I don't love my wife primarily because that's what she deserves. I love her first because Jesus tells me to because of my love for him. And then what's amazing is that as I do that, my love for her becomes more pure. It becomes better than I ever could love her if it was just me and her. So even my relationships have to be submitted. I have to give up anything in my life that has taken the place of God in my heart. I have to give that to him. And it means that I could literally lose everything and still have joy because of Jesus. That's the goal. That's what Paul was saying. Are you at the point where the only thing that will control your decisions, your directions, and your desires is the gain of knowing and honoring Jesus Christ in your life? If not, there's work to be done. When you meet Jesus, truly meet Jesus, everything else becomes rubbish because compared to Jesus everything else is rubbish it is and so how do we get there Hebrews 12 chapter 1 through 2 I think this verse is so timely for us therefore since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the, father, the founder and protector of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. If you want to understand the worth of Jesus... Spend less time looking at everything else and make your life about looking for and looking towards him. How do I look towards Jesus? I just want to give you four things really quickly that I think will help each of us begin to consider all things as rubbish for the sake of gaining Christ. The first one is ask for help. Ask for help. If you look at your life and you go, man, there are a lot of things that I just am not willing to give up. Ask for help. This is a work that begins and ends with God's spirit fueling and empowering the process. So ask for help from God. Tell him where you're at. We don't need to put a front on for God or act as if we have it all together. Tell him where you are at today and ask for his help. And then understand this task is easier if you have other believers holding you up, encouraging you, and keeping you accountable. The idea of pursuing after Christ with my whole heart is really scary sometimes. Because I know there's going to be a cost that I'm not necessarily willing to pay. But if I have friends, brothers and sisters in Christ who are doing it with me, um, it may not be perfectly easy as I want it to be, but it's, it's easier to do it with brothers and sisters who have the same goal in mind. The second thing, be ruthless with clutter removal. And I mean ruthless. Force yourself to make some decisions. And use this phrase, um, nothing is safe, okay? And what I'm talking about really specifically is external trappings of our life. I'm not talking about relationships, um, though there may be some God does ask you to leave behind. But I'm talking specifically about the things in our life. And remember, this process is going to look different for each of us. 
Our decisions must be made and based on where God calls. So, you know, there are going to be some who have a conviction to live this way, and there are going to be others who have a conviction to live this way. But the question for you is, God, how are you asking me to put you first? And then do what he leads. But at the same time, remember, and this is what I really believe, there are things that um, followers of Jesus should have as no part of their life. If, If you want to put God first, if you want to consider all things rubbish for the sake of him, and you know there's an error in your life that you're walking in sin, and he wants you to give up, you have to do whatever it takes to get it out. Talk to someone, talk to your pastors, your small group leaders, whoever it is, pray about it, and resolve for the sake of gaining him to give that up. Here's a helpful axiom regarding stuff. If you feel like you can't get rid of it, you may need to. And I don't know what that looks like in your life. It may be um, an Xbox. It may be a vacation home, whatever it is. But if you feel like there's something in your life where you're like, yep, I know that God is asking me to give this up for whatever reason. I don't even know why. But I know that I'm not supposed to be having this. Then you have to give it up. Number three, fill the void with one who belongs there. What I mean by that is if your effort is to, to gain Christ, to consider everything else rubbish, spend more time thinking about him. Spend more time doing the things that he asks you to do. Praying, reading the Bible, loving your neighbor, spending fellowship with Christian believers, serving people. Because what's amazing is as I begin to walk out the lifestyle that God has called me to live, my feelings for him are magnified. And then the fourth thing, remember grace. It's all about progress, not perfection, because we're not going to get there in this life. Paul himself says in verse 12, not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Those four steps that I gave you, what what they're trying to do, the reason I I, I kind of came up with those specific steps is I was trying to think about, man, what did Paul have to go through to follow after Jesus? I'm trying to create some sort of synthesis, though I live in a world where no one's going to make me do anything as a result of my following of Jesus, not yet at least. I'm trying to create a world where I have some sort of inward guide that says, God, I want to live a life of constant purification, not so that I can feel better than anybody else, not for my pride, but just so that I can know you more. I just want to know you more, Jesus. The truth is that the Bible may not literally call all of us to sell everything that we have and go follow after Jesus. But listen to me, too many of us live our lives refusing to consider the possibility that any of us are called to do anything other than what everyone else in our circle does. God is going to call you to do things that don't make sense to people, yourself included. Every time you obey that call, you're choosing the greater portion instead of the lesser. The real over the rubbish. He's going to call you to give up certain things. He's going to call you to pick up certain practices. He's going to call you to, to sell your dream car or to, to, date, to not date that person who finally seems interested in you or to quit your job. Or he's going to call you to join a volleyball league that your coworker invited you to that you really don't want to be a part of. Or he's going to call you to go pray for your neighbor's cancer and you don't want to be that weird person who, who freaks people out, but, but you know he's asking you to do it. Each decision that you make, which is sacrificing your self-authority or autonomy on the altar of love. Each decision choosing the heavenly reality over the rubbish. I don't know what it is, but God is going to ask you. And what you can believe is that it's always part of a plan, of his perfect plan, and it's always going to be worked for your good. Because God is desperate to get his people. He is desperate to get you to the place where you consider all things as rubbish when compared to him. Because anything less than that dishonors him and it kills us. That's his agenda. To get you in a place where above anything else in your life, he matters most. Because when God's people buy into that idea, 
He gets the glory, we get the blessing, and the world changes. I've adopted the mantra in my life, I'd rather be wrong trying to obey than to do nothing. Because I think so often in our lives, we, we make excuses for why we can't do things that sometimes don't make sense. Ah, oh, that couldn't be God. That's, that's too out there. No, I, I shouldn't do it because of this. Listen to me. God will never call you to violate his, his word. But he will ask you to do things that don't make sense to you. And my resolve is this. I'm, I, I so want to be with him. I so want to experience him now in the fullness that I'm willing to try to, with wisdom and humility and faith, walk out in obedience and maybe make some uh, mistakes along the way than to just do nothing. I don't want to be the servant who hid my life, my talents underground. We're going to take communion together now as a church family in our homes, in our city, in our world. And communion is a time where God's people, as instituted by Jesus Christ himself, we remember what he did. We remember his body broken for us, his blood poured out for us, and what that act, that beautiful and perfect act, secured for us, which is salvation by faith alone. And I love communion because communion is a time where we can take stock of our lives. We get to be honest with ourselves. The scripture really commands us as we take communion to be honest with where we're at. Don't hide from God. You don't have to put on a a fake face. We're going to prepare for communion together. And as we do that, I want you to ask the question, God, are there things in my life that have usurped your place on the throne of my heart? Am I in a place where there are things that I am not willing to call rubbish that I might gain you? As we reflect on the infinite worth of our Savior and his sacrifice, Let's ask God, Lord, would you center our hearts around you, Father? God, your gifts are so good, and I'm so thankful for them. I'm so thankful for the life that you've given me, the blessings that I've received, Father. But I pray that the abundance and the prosperity that I live with, Lord, I pray that it would never lead me to love the gifts more than the giver. Lord, I pray that for each of your people that are hearing this message, Lord, that more and more we would be able to say with all honesty like Paul, I count everything as rubbish when I compare it to the surpassing worth of you, Jesus, your sacrifice, your body, your blood broken and poured out for me so that I might have life. Let's just take a moment together to reflect what Jesus has done in our lives, and then I'll lead us in communion. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that you are the bread of life. Lord, as we take this bread, Father, which symbolizes your perfect 
life and body which was broken for us. I pray that we would be filled with the fullness of who you are. And we would never undervalue the immense, immeasurable worth of your sacrifice. And that you would transform us even as we take it together today. Let's take the bread. Paul continues, in the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus, I thank you. The scripture says that though my sins were scarlet, you've made them white as snow. I thank you that your blood washes my iniquity and cleanses me of unrighteousness. I pray that, Lord, the, the, the shocking and, and even graphic nature, Lord, of the idea of your body being broken on the cross for us, your blood being poured out for my sake, Lord, I pray that it would never lose its deep and tangible significance in our lives. Jesus, you're so good, and we thank you, Father. Let's take the cup. Lord, you're so good. I thank you that compared to you, Father, the troubles of this life, the blessings, everything, Father, it pales. At the vision of you, God, everything else falls away. And so I pray that we would live that way, Lord. I pray that we would be bold. I pray that we would be free, hopeful, and joyful as we encounter the image of you, God. You're so good, and we love you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for being here with us at River City Online. Our mission here at River City is to see more people living real life by passionately following Jesus. And we get the question all the time, what is real life? Well, real life is following Jesus. And I think Pastor Ryan just gave us a huge example on what following Jesus looks like and all the things that can take the place of him. So right now, what is sitting on the throne of your heart that God is asking you to push off? to take away, to, to completely remove for the gain of him. Guys, make that a prayer point this week, and we are so looking forward to what God is going to say to us, and we want to hear what God is saying to you. Right now, we do have a very special guest with us here today. This is Mark Soto. He is going to be our new online campus host. Guys, it has been an honor for me to do this and be here with you through this whole thing, but... Next week, we are moving inside, and I'm going with them. So from now on, you're going to see Mark. So I just want to give him a moment just to say hey and just to share a few things with you. Yes, thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be the online host for River City Community Church. Um, I hope I hope I entertain and, <laughs> and all those things. But just a, just a reminder, next week, we will be back in the building um, as scheduled. So actually the times will be at 9.30 and 11.30. So join us online or join us in person. Uh, grab a friend. It's going to be so cool. So make sure you guys are here at 9.30 and 11.30 a.m. next week if you want to join us live here. But if you're online, you will see Mark's face and he will be an awesome host for you guys. We're really looking forward to his time with us. Guys, um, if you need to know anything about our service coming up, you can go to reallife.org slash we are back to sign up your kids for children's ministry, to find out any information about how our service is going to run. And again, the times, guys, the times are 930 and 1130 a.m. We are so excited and we are ready for you for next week. Have a great week. We love you. We'll see you later. See you.